Hello, my name is Wendell Nauman. I'm a gynecologic oncologist at the Levine Cancer Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm the co-director of the IGCS Education 360 program. Today, we are pleased to bring you a special IGCS discussion about cervical cancer survivorship from a patient perspective. January is a month that many countries recognize as Cervical Cancer Awareness or Cervical Health Awareness Month. We can now prevent most cases of cervical cancer through HPV vaccination and screening. However, despite our advances in the prevention, detection, and treatment of cervical cancer, we still have over 14,000 cases a year in the United States and over half a million cases worldwide, resulting in approximately 250,000 deaths annually. In addition, over 300,000 women each year have abnormal pap smears and require treatment for pre-invasive cervical cancer. This diagnosis can be devastating as many women with cervical cancer are diagnosed at a young age. Due to this, more years of life are lost per death from cervical cancer than any other gynecologic malignancy. And with many women with advanced cervical cancer have young children. Even in the United States, cervical cancer is one of the leading causes of cancer-related mortality in women ages 20 to 40. The World Health Organization's global strategy says that all countries should reach and maintain an incidence rate of fewer than four new cases of cervical cancer per 100,000 women per year. While some countries have accomplished this milestone, we have a long way to go to reach this goal worldwide. In fact, the rate of cervical cancer in the United States is twice as high as the goal set by the WHO. The WHO has named three key pillars to eliminate cervical cancer, and these are vaccination, screening, and treatment. This 90-70-90 plan outlines the following goals. 90% of girls vaccinated with HPV vaccine by age 15, 70% of women screened using high-performance screening tests at the age of 35 and again at the age of 45, and the detection and treatment of 90% of women with precancer and the treatment of 90% of patients with invasive cancer. Today, I'm talking to a cervical cancer survivor, Haley Saunders, about perspectives on cervical cancer treatment and survivorship. This program is supported in part by an educational grant from CGEN. Haley, welcome, and thank you for agreeing to share your story. First off, congratulations on your eight-year survivorship. I know you've gone through a lot to get here, and thank you for agreeing to share your journey. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about when you were diagnosed with cervical cancer, sort of what struck you at that time, and where were you in your life? I know you were very young. I was. Um, so I was diagnosed at the very end of 2014. Um, I was working as a nurse in the emergency department. Um, and as anybody who might have a medical background might know, we don't necessarily always um, take care of ourselves the way we take care of others. Um, so I had been having some um, ongoing symptoms. Um, specifically, I had um, vaginal bleeding and um, had waited a little bit to take care of it and eventually got an appointment with my um gynecologist and um, we completed a pap smear um, and found out that um, I had cervical cancer. And that was when I met Dr. Nauman. Um, and that was the very end of 2014, the beginning of 2015. And tell me a little bit about your treatment and, and sort of what you went through and what you were thinking when you got this diagnosis and, and sort of how did that impact you? Absolutely. So I was 30 um, at the time, um, not really something that was even on my radar, even as a nurse, um, that this would be something that I would have to go through. So things moved really quickly after the diagnosis, um, you know, thanks to the care that you provided. Um, so pretty quickly, we um, uh, I had surgery, I had a, a radical hysterectomy. And during that surgery, it was found that it had metastasized to my lymph nodes. Um, so because of that discovery during the surgery, um, we proceeded to do um, both chemo um, and concurrent radiation. I did cisplatin, um, a course of cisplatin um, with um, pelvic radiation. Um, the treatment itself was not the, the most fun I've ever had. Um, it was rigorous. Um, I was in radiation every day for four weeks. Um, I had chemo once a week. Um, didn't feel too great, uh, had the kind of typical symptoms that one has um, with chemotherapy. So um, nausea, um, weight loss, 
actually had a little bit of a hearing loss. Um, and then with the pelvic radiation, um, I had symptoms that were more specific to that area since that was the area that was being treated. Um, so urinary type symptoms, things like that. Um, and about, I think we did um, six weeks of treatment. And then after that, uh, received a PET scan, follow-up PET scan post-treatment. Um, and there was at that time, no evidence of disease. So you did, did well for a while. And tell me what happened after that. Sure. So um, that was, I guess, the middle of um, 2015. Um, you know, recovered well, um, went back to my normal life. And in um, 2018, um, I was much more diligent about the smallest of symptoms and had a persistent nagging cough. Um, and as someone who typically, you know, out, outside of cancer, obviously wasn't, a, didn't get sick very often, you know, um, it lasted a lot longer than it a normal cough would. So I was pretty quick to um, go into my primary care doctor. Um, and just because of my history, he did go ahead and order a chest x-ray. Um, that chest x-ray came back positive for um, a cervical cancer metastasis, found out. So, so I mean, you, you got this x-ray and you have a mass and you have a history of cervical cancer. I know that had to be devastating. And what, what were you thinking at that time? You Terrified. I'm sure. Um, yep. So one bout with can cancer at that age and you get past it and you're like, I'm golden. You know, this is it um, in the clear. So when you get the um, the news that it is um, recurrent and it's metastasized to, um, you know, another organ, um, sheer terror um, that I remember making that phone call to my parents um, delivering the news that I never thought, you know, that I would have to deliver. And I was just really scared. Yeah. yeah I can't imagine. So, um, you, you got, uh, an experimental treatment, uh, and, and actually did quite well with that, um, uh, off and on. And now that was, I guess now five years ago, right? So that's, uh, it is. on that. So I guess, you know, um, what, what do you think the, the most surprising uh, thing about your treatment was? A lot of it, probably. Um, so at the time, to me, um, immunotherapy um, was the treatment that I received. It was something um, that was a little bit groundbreaking and revolutionary, um, at least to me, um, being outside of the oncology field um, was not something I was overly familiar with. Um, I know that they had used similar drugs in melanoma patients, um, but to me, melanoma felt very different. Um, so I didn't really have a whole lot of exposure to what to expect. Um, that being said, um, all things considered, um, the treatment itself, um, there were two drugs. The first one I was on um, for um, four rounds. And then the second one I actually did for two years. Um, and there were a couple start stops in the middle of that, um, a couple bouts of something um, called pneumonitis. Um, so basically a um, similar to pneumonia flare up from um, the immunotherapy drugs. Um, but outside of that, um, as you can see, I obviously had a really positive response from the drugs and a really great outcome. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting. So, uh, we've had two drug approvals uh, since you were diagnosed um, in cervical cancer, which is great. One one was the immunotherapy and one is a targeted therapy. And I think, um, you know, I think that probably gives people hope. Uh, the the trials even a decade ago were pretty disappointing in terms of outcomes. And um, I, I think these things have, have revolutionized uh, the, the treatment for cervical cancer, even advanced cervical cancer. I guess, um, you know, in terms of how has this changed you and how do you think about cancer and your health and those kind of things now? Is that <laughs> probably don't take it for granted anymore, I suspect. No, right. So um, obviously this was life changing for me. Um, I learned a lot about 
the medical community, um, even being in it myself, um, seeing things from a patient's perspective, um, learned a lot about how precious life is. Um, and how many things that I have to offer, um, not only um, the world, but other cancer survivors as well. Um, because, you know, like you said, I am five years out um, post-treatment now, and I'm doing great. You know, I spend a lot of time outdoors. I'm extremely active, and I wouldn't have been able to do that without the kind of treatment and care that I received. Yeah. And so- Obviously, yeah. very thankful. Yeah, in that treatment, what what resources were important? What what do you think really that you needed? And I guess the the flip side of that is, what do you wish you had had? What can the medical community do better? Well, <laughs> um, I had a phenomenal experience. I don't feel like I missed anything. Um, I very blessed and very thankful that I. Um, had you as a physician, um, someone kind of leading the charge on some of these um, groundbreaking clinical trials and being able to get the opportunity to be a part of that. Um, The nursing staff um, that took care of me both in the clinic and the hospital were amazing. Um, Your clinic also has um, patient care navigators um, which is an amazing resource to have as well. Um, just even, um, you know, simple things like um, growing so close with the folks that I saw so often would come in and check on me. Um, I had people come in and visit me in the infusion room. I had people visit me in the clinic, just popping in to say, hey. And um, I think just knowing that you have the support of the community and um, they care on a personal level was really um made a big difference to me yeah Yeah. so actually probably i i'm not sure a lot of people know what a a navigator is do you yeah go into how they helped you and and exactly what that role is absolutely so um the way that it worked for um my plan of care and when i was receiving treatment is pretty much from your first visit Um, in the clinic um, after diagnosis, they are there to support you along the way. And that can be anything. So that can be um, moral support. That can be setting you up with support groups um, outside of the clinic. Um, I had a consultation at one point for um, uh, related to chemotherapy if hair loss was going to be a part of the um, symptom management Um, There were, they would make appointments for wig fittings, um, things like that. So there is no um, detail that's too small that they weren't willing to help you with. That's great. So what advice would you give somebody who was in your situation if you got a phone call from a friend and and what would you tell them? What's, what's, what's the, what are the important things in terms of preparing yourself for these type of treatments and journeys? Sure. Um, Just be very diligent about your health. Um, For me, I found it super helpful to kind of track my symptoms. um, And that can be a pen and a paper um, even or an app in your phone. um, Because I think it's important to understand what's normal for you and what's not normal for you. um, And being able to follow up on those things, um, making sure that you do have Um, a really open line of communication with your caregivers. Um, I was just thinking um, before this call, Dr. Nauman, this is probably the longest that I've gone without seeing you in years. Um, And it's only because I live in Colorado now, but, you know, it's it's nice to know that you have um, the ongoing, like, open line of communication um, with the physicians and the nursing staff in the clinics and just maintaining that. Um, so that if you do need something, you're able to reach out. Thanks. Thanks for that. So, um, yeah, I, I think some people are probably not aware that uh, that uh, we have a vaccine that's highly effective in preventing cervical cancer, but also prevents abnormal pap smears and rectal cancer and vaginal cancer and vulvar cancer and head and neck cancer. Can you think of any reason people wouldn't want to take that vaccine? I can't. Any reason? Um, so I, you know, 
Uh, this is a vaccine that's available to to women uh, age nine to uh, to thirteen, and so it's mm -hmm. only two shots, and it could prevent ninety percent of these things. So um, it's been very difficult, and I think frustrating as a physician getting people to uh, to take these vaccines. So. Yeah, and um, so my cancer was um, related to HPV. Like you said, ninety percent of these type of cancers are. Um, the direct result of um, HPV. Um, and that being said, that vaccine was not available to me when I was 15 years old to get. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what my age is now, but <laughs> at the time it was not available. So if it had been, obviously that would have saved me a lot of heartache. Yes, I agree. So, but I would encourage parents to, to uh, vaccinate their children. I mean, this is uh, this, if, even if cervical cancer is a is sort of a, something that they don't see or know anybody. I think almost everybody knows somebody with an abnormal pap smear, and this can prevent treatment for abnormal pap smears as well. So, well, thank you again for sharing your story and giving hope to women with advanced cervical cancer. And uh, I would like to leave everybody with a call to action to join the global strategy to eliminate cervical cancer. It really starts with education and awareness in your home and communities. Uh, we need to continue to promote the vaccination and screening for cervical cancer. Um, IGSCS actually on their website has an excellent social media toolkit uh, that uh, you can share facts about HPV and cervical cancer with your family and friends uh, to start a discussion about vaccination. I think we can all play a part in spreading education and this knowledge can really make a difference. So I think together we can eliminate cervical cancer. So we wish you all continued health and safety. Stay well. Thank you.